It's great to welcome to the program today Ken Caldera, who's a climate scientist at the Carnegie Institution for Sciences Department of Global Ecology, also a professor by courtesy in the Stanford University Department of Earth System Science. We've been talking, Ken, about many different aspects of how the climate on our planet is changing. And one of those that I've mentioned a few times now is the acidification of our oceans. Let's start with what that means and why this is a relevant area of study when we think about climate change. When we burn coal, oil or gas, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But over time, most of that carbon dioxide will get absorbed by the ocean. And this is a problem because when carbon dioxide reacts with seawater, it becomes carbonic acid. And in high enough concentrations, the carbonic acid can dissolve the shells and skeletons of marine organisms. And even in the lower concentrations that we're expecting this century, it can make it more difficult for marine organisms to grow their shells and skeletons. And this is likely to be devastating for some marine ecosystems, and uh, we're unsure what, what it will do to other marine e ecosystems. What's our basis for measurement? In other words, if we say, well, the oceans are more acidic, how is that measured? Sort of what's the scale and how much of a change are we seeing in terms of the, uh, the, the level of acidity? Scientists measure something called pH, which is a measure of the uh, hydrogen ion concentration or activity in the ocean. And and uh, so what's really important is how much the different chemical species are changing, especially the building blocks with which uh, marine organisms build their shells and skeletons. And so since the um, uh, pre-industrial time, so be before the Industrial Revolution, that maybe the uh, concentration of hydrogen ions has gone up something like 30%. And uh, and this means also that some of the building blocks that marine organisms to build their shells and skeletons have gone down by 30 percent. But uh, more or less, it goes opposite to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So if atmospheric CO2 doubles, some of the essential building blocks that marine organisms need need to build their shells gets cut in half. And, and this is going to have big impacts, especially for coral reefs and other ecosystems that depend on these sort of hard bony structures. Yeah. And before we dig more into that, just to get to 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 get this talking point out of the way before we go further, if somebody hears you say compared to the pre-industrial revolution and they say, well, the tools we had then are, are nothing like the tools we have now for doing this kind of science. How do we know what the levels were prior to the industrial revolution? The answer is what? The, yes, as you point out, the the biological effects are uncertain, but the chemical effects are well known. And that's because uh, you, you, we do things with fancy models, but you don't need fancy models. You could take a, a bucket of seawater and put it under a bell jar and change the CO2 concentrations uh, in, of the overlying gases in that bell jar and then look at the chemistry of the seawater and see how it changes. And so the, the chemistry of how carbon dioxide affects uh, seawater is extremely well understood. And there are a number indica of indicators of what chemistry were in the past. We can see where shells were forming in, in the past. But the main thing is you don't need any fancy models. You can just put a bucket of seawater under different uh, concentrations of CO2 and see how the chemistry changes. So the, the chemical changes are well understood and well known. But the biological effects are highly uncertain in many cases. So let's talk through now the, the sort of successive impact on the ecosystem. The, the water becomes more acidic. This impacts, as you've mentioned, all sorts of uh, it, coral reefs significantly, but also, I, if I understand correctly, crustaceans and other sea life as well. Yes, I have a postdoc working with me who's looking at how uh, ocean acidification affects the larval stages of sea urchins and it inhibits their growth. Similar experiments have been done on oyster larvae and, and uh, many other marine organisms. It seems that often it's the larval stages that are most sensitive because if you think of uh, adults are better able to control their environment, but these little larvae with just a few cells in them 
are, are very sensitive to changes in ocean chemistry, and that's when they're needing to build their uh, a lot of their hard bony parts, and, and they're having more trouble doing it in, in more acidic oceans. And what would be some of the possible subsequent effects of this on the broader ocean ecosystem and then even of the entire planet? A lot of my study has been focused on coral reefs, and that's kind of the easiest system to understand what's going on because one type of organism builds the very architecture of that ecosystem. And we know that if hard stony corals disappear, that coral reef ecosystem is going to disappear. So we've done experiments showing that ocean chemistry influences the rate at which the corals can grow their skeletons. And if we project forward uh, from our experiments, uh, we would con conclude that sometime in a few decades, uh, nearly all the coral reefs in the world are likely to be in a net eroding, losing mass. And once those uh, coral reefs lose enough of that calcium carbonate stony material, uh, the reef won't be able to survive. Now, uh, you know, we know we've also done work along the California coastal system, and we know that the larvae of many of the marine organisms that live along the California coast are sensitive to ocean acidification. But it's a very complicated ecosystem, and it's unknown uh, if you start toying with creatures near the base of the food chain, how is that going to affect the entire ecosystem? It's impossible to conduct a, a real experiment on that. And so um, you know, I think we can expect that big changes will come, but, but exactly what those changes will be are hard to predict. You've talked a little bit about sort of what maybe solutions or mitigating activities might be for this problem. What, one of the things I've seen you say would not be particularly useful, at least as far as ocean acidification is concerned, is sort of solar geoengineering, right? We sometimes hear about reflecting some portion of sunlight back into space to counteract warming of the earth. But that you've said specifically with the issue you study wouldn't really make a, a difference because you're talking about CO2 content on earth, right? Yes. Carbon dioxide has both chemical effects and uh, physical effects on earth's uh, radiation balance or earth's climate system. And so even if you could somehow correct the climate effects of carbon dioxide, we'd still be stuck with the chemical effects. Now, we did, on a small patch of reef, do an experiment where we threw an antacid into the seawater and, and neutralized some of that carbon acidity and showed that the coral reef grew faster under those circumstances. But this would be impractical to do at a huge scale. So hmm. I could imagine somebody trying to protect a little marine sanctuary in a bay somewhere through these kind of approaches, and it would be very expensive and difficult. But to do something the size of the Great Barrier Reef, I think it's just not feasible. So what are more feasible, or uh, at, at least conceptually so, uh, ways that we could work on this issue? Well, there are two main things we need to be doing. One is we need to be transforming our energy system into one that does not rely on using the sky and the oceans as a waste dump for our carbon dioxide pollution. And so this means building, uh, you know, renewable energy systems and perhaps nuclear systems and so on. The other main thing we need to do is try to relieve as many other stressors on marine ecosystems as possible. Marine ecosystems are not only subject to ocean acidification, but also, as we pointed out, to, to global warming, coastal pollution, overfishing, uh, pesticide runoff, and so on. And so uh, the more we can relieve these other stressors on marine systems, the more resilient they're likely to be to ocean acidification. Very, very important issue. One we will also touch on with Elizabeth Colbert, who is going to be on the program, who, who interviewed you um, uh, uh, extensively, it seems like anyway, for her, her yes. book, The Sixth Extinction. She came with us on one of our experiments to the coral reef in, uh, to some coral reef in the Great Barrier Reef in That's right. Australia, and it was great to have her there. Absolutely fascinating. We've been speaking with Ken Caldera, climate scientist at the Carnegie Institution for Sciences Department of Global Ecology. Ken, thanks a lot for talking to us today. Thank you very much.